getting somewhere, getting over here, double checking everything's on as it should be, and, all right, now it's not that hard, let me see, oh, wait, see it, saw it, maybe, okay, give me one second, guys, as I'm just trying to make sure I can find the video so I can actually see if any comments pop up, as, good, okay, here we go, here we go, I've got it, all right, good morning, everyone, thanks so much for joining me, okay, well, I had it, all right, Okay, all right, I see a comment. We'll work with that. It's sideways, but I think I can figure that out. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for joining me today. We are at that time again uh, for a fun little presentation, or I like to think that they're fun. And this time we are gonna be talking about wild turkeys, which is always exciting. Uh, now I'm gonna be, I'm going to be honest with you guys, I don't have any turkey recipes, nor am I going to tell you the best way to plate your turkey. Uh, we're not really talking about that part of turkeys, we're talking about all the other cool things about it. So hold on for one more week until Thanksgiving, we're almost there, but we're not there yet. Uh, so we'll be talking about all the other really cool parts about these birds, because um, they do have a very interesting behavior and style as well. Uh, so if you guys have any questions at all during this presentation, I do have the comments sideways on my phone. That'll be fun. And we can go from there, too. So with that, we're going to go ahead and get started. I think the most important part before discussing anything about turkeys is how did they get their name? Uh, because we've got the turkey bird and the turkey country, and sometimes that can get a little confusing depending on how the conversation goes. So just a little bit of history and backstory on this, because it's really interesting, is the turkey is originally, the turkey bird is originally from North America, but was first domesticated in Mexico uh, way before the Europeans had ever gotten here. When the Spanish came and conquered the native peoples of Mexico in around the 1500s, they took a lot of stuff back with them to Europe, including the turkey. And the turkey was a huge hit for many reasons like it is today. It's a very large bird. It has very rich taste. So that wasn't something that people got very often. Uh, so it was a big hit. And they eventually domesticated it over in Europe as well. When the English got a hold of it, they were the ones that looked at it and were like, ah, yes, we're definitely going to name this after the Turkish Ottoman Empire, which was super big at the time. Whether or not this was due to certain trade routes where they got confused with the guinea fowl, who was also in that area, um, or like everything else where if it was really exotic, it was just cool and hip to name it after the uh, Turkish Empire at the time. So that is kind of how the turkey got its name that way. And of course, as it was domesticating everything over there, uh, when the English eventually came back to North America and settled colonies over on the East Coast, they reintroduced a turkey uh, or the bird that was native to North America back into North America, which is pretty interesting. Um, so from there, their population definitely grew. They did really well. Uh, there was an issue where the populations for turkeys did start to dwindle in the 1920s because there were no conserva conservation efforts in place. And again, these birds were super popular for a lot of different reasons. Um, so of course, hunters were actually the first one to notice, hey, these populations are going down, we gotta do something about it so we can conserve it for a long time to come and we can still enjoy it. So from there, efforts took place where they actually started conserving the numbers, they started reducing back and um, implementing like those hunting policies, as well as transplanting certain individuals to various other parts of the country to help rekindle the population. And it worked. Turkeys are now at a, a standard level of population. We're not worried about how they're doing today, so they're doing very well. Um, so that's just a fun little history about how far the turkey has come from back in the day. Um, one other thing I'm going to mention, because I'll probably refer to the turkeys as both male and female and a bunch, bunch of other different names. So just to clear up some of that, um, they do also go by some different names as well. So adult males actually go by toms or gobblers. Your males that are at least one year old but are not quite completely fully developed are your jakes. So they're still a juvenile bird. They're jakes. Females, both adult or a little bit younger, are called hens. And then the young that still kind of follow their mom around and not, they're not independent yet are called poults as well. Uh, so in case you hear any of those, that's what that uh, verbiage is talking about too. So into a little bit more of the standard information for turkeys these days. They are from the order Galliformes, which means landfowl. So usually we see these guys walking around pretty often and they're in that same family or same order, but they are in the family Phasianidae. So that means they're closely related to grouse, pheasants, quail, chickens, peafowl. So, I mean, you could see that by looking at them, but those are their, their clo closest relatives. 
For habitat, these guys honestly go through a wide range. If you look at the purple here, that is their year-round habitat. So these, they can be found in any of these locations. They do require three specific things to be found in a territory year-round, which is what they're looking for. First off is securely elevated nocturnal roosts. These guys don't sleep on the ground. They sleep up in the trees. They do fly. They can actually clock up to 55 miles per hour, so they're doing pretty well for themselves. But they do, nest, uh, they do sleep in trees, so they need that as a requirement. They do also need dense foliage for nesting because that's going to help protect their nests because they do nest on the ground. And then also in the winter time, they focus a lot on mast producing trees or nut bearing trees for winter food. So they need to have that available in their territory because once again, these guys aren't really migratory. They usually stay in the same place year round uh, with a territory range anywhere from 400 to 2000 acres or two to four square miles. So they do a lot of walking in this territory as well. Usually the lifespan ranges from three to five years. If one gets lucky or they're in captivity, they can be up to 10 to 13. Uh, their weight also varies with your hens weighing much less than your gobblers. So that can be anywhere from five to 10 pounds for the hens and then 10 to 20 for the gobblers. Sometimes they're a little bit more past that, but these are usually the average ranges. And then just to kind of give you guys that idea as well, these guys can be about two and a half to three and a half feet tall. So they're not small birds. <laughs> if you've never seen a turkey in person, these guys are a little bit larger than you might think. So like I said earlier, turkeys are originally from North America and there's actually two species of turkeys in the world and they're both located in uh, North America as well. So all over the world and there's just two species and we have one and that is the wild turkey. Um, the oscillated turkey is actually found down in Mexico as well. So we don't have him but he's a very close neighbor depending on where you want to go look too. Uh, but you can see that they look very similar because again they're both turkeys. So let's talk about ID a little bit. Um, they're both, so turkeys are large game birds. They have a large overall body size, a very small head on a longer neck, and you do know that their head is um, doesn't have many feathers. Uh, they also do have a long, some long legs too. Their tail at the end, whether or not it's like puffed up or just kind of straight down, is rounded. So it's not pointed, it's not notched, it's just rounded at the end. Um, their head their heads do change color a little bit depending on how excited they are, whether that's frustration or anger or just like surprise. Uh, they can adjust their uh, facial colors depending on the situation. And then they all also do have quite the variety of ornaments as well. So first off is, I think the funniest word for me, is the snood. This is that little piece of skin that kind of hangs over the beak. Um, it can become longer or sh shorter depending on a bunch of different things, so that can change size. But um, both your males and females do have a snood, however in the females it is much more reduced, so you're only going to see them very prominently on the males. The wattle is underneath the beak there, again both species have that. Um, Going down from the head a little bit on the breast, you've got the beard. And this is basically hair-like feathers that all extend from the same follicle. And these are gonna be found only in the males. Less than 5% of females actually have a beard. And if they do, it's gonna be something pretty small. So if you see one of these, that's kind of a giveaway that it's a male there. And then you've also got the spurs, which are down by the ankles of these birds. They're basically very sharp and pointy and used for combat, and you don't really want to deal with them. Um, those are primarily on the males as well. The females don't have any. The beard and the spurs can determine um, the age depending on how long they are. So the shorter these ornaments or the, um, not ornaments, the body features that they have, uh, the younger the bird. The longer or more prominent they are, the older the bird. And of course, we've got some fun noises, uh, fun sounds and calls from these birds as well. You've got the song. This is produced primarily by the male. Good old strong gobble there. Probably what a lot of us know that as. And then they've also got a wide variety of other calls too. These can usually happen throughout the year. Um, the gobbles are probably the loudest call, and then they've got other calls that they will use amongst themselves that might not be as loud. Kind of sounds like a barking dog. You probably would still hear this one. Um, 
but these are primarily used in more communication. So definitely a very interesting range of calls, for sure, but they're very distinct. So if you know what you're looking for, um, you can know whether or not you have a turkey in your area. Um, another thing as well is that you can identify um, males and females by their um, feather coloration on the breast. So for your females, and this one's going to be a harder one to see, I couldn't really get any good examples of this one. Uh, the breast feathers are tipped a brown kind of coloration, while on the breast feathers of the males, they're tipped kind of black. And again, that's hard to see due to lighting, uh, but that is apparently another factor you can also check to ID um, whether or not a bird is male or female. Now, overall, all the feathers on the turkeys are very impressive. Uh, they can have up to 5,000 or more feathers, 18 of which make that giant tail feather fan that a lot of you are used to seeing on males, whether that is in um, advertisements for turkeys in general or for Thanksgiving. Uh, the tails and the primary feathers are actually another good indicator as to whether or not it is an adult or juvenile male. Um, so for your adult males, they have a standard kind of straight, smooth fan edge when they fan out their tails, while your younger males are going to have it where the middle feathers are taller than the outer feathers on this fanned tail. Um, in this case, I'm not sure if it's younger or just molting, but for the most part, you would have that kind of look when you have a younger male. Um, not only that, but on the primary feathers, on the very end of the wing feathers, if it is a juvenile um, turkey, the end of the feather will be pointed and also be completely black compared to this black and white feature you see here. Um, for the adults, it would actually be rounded rather than pointed, and that black and white would be a pattern all the way throughout the end of the feather too. So those are, again, minute details you won't necessarily see, but I found interesting as factors to identify. Of course, these feathers are also very iridescent, so they've got that shiny, glossy look that you might recognize in hummingbirds. Um, this is actually the structure of the feather reflecting light back to our eye to make it that shiny look. They don't have to eat certain foods to make it that color like a cardinal would to have to produce those red feathers. Uh, the feathers are just structured like that already. And while I did say there are two species of turkeys, there are five subspecies of wild turkeys that can be found throughout the U.S. Um, again, a subspecies is still designated as one species of bird, so like it's all still the wild turkey, but due to various reasons such as physical, um, physical boundaries, so like the Rocky Mountains or the Mississippi, um, these two subspecies haven't really like interacted so sometimes that changes overall coloration and um, feather patterns as well. So these two subspecies could still breed together but in this case um, they are um, separated and have their own individual qualities that you can notice from subspecies to subspecies which I always find fun as well. Sorry the phone decided to be rude for a second and I couldn't I lost if anybody oh good okay I see all these good mornings and stuff okay perfect now I'm back on track sorry guys so with that said uh, these guys are naturally ground feeders as well. You, while I said they do roost up in the trees at night, you're usually going to find them on the ground during the day foraging for food that they can find. Um, these birds are omnivorous, so they take, they take advantage of a large variety of food styles. Um, one of the bigger ones is a lot of mast, which is fruit and nuts of forest trees and shrubs, so think like acorns um, and other things like that, cherries and other things. Um, but they also take advantage of regular seeds, other greeny, um, like greeny, <laughs> other greens and insects. Uh, when they are younger, these guys take advantage of a lot more of the insects. They're focusing on a more high protein diet because they need a lot of that nutrition to help uh, grow up big and strong. And once they are adults or much older, they kind of switch to a more green diet because they don't need as much of that protein uh, to sustain themselves as well. Now, 
I will say, if you've ever prepped your turkey for Thanksgiving, you might have come across the gizzard. This is very important for turkeys when they're eating their food. If they're eating a lot of mast or a lot of things with hard shell or hard food items, they're going to need something to help them out with that because they don't have teeth, right? So the gizzard is a strong muscular pouch used to grind up hard food items. It has chitinous teeth and a lot of folds that basically help grind up these food items so it can continue along its digest digestion path uh, without causing too many problems. While the gizzard on its own is super helpful, sometimes adding extra grit or extra things to help smooth these materials out is very important. So things like certain types of sand or dirt, eggshell, eggshells, all that stuff basically help grind these materials down a little bit easier uh, so the bird can continue to eat. So that's always fun as well too. Now, courtship is probably one of the more interesting things compared to a lot of the songbirds we talked about previously. Um, Turkeys themselves are polygynous, so um, multiple males will mate with multiple females, all that stuff. Uh, there's not really any monogamous relationships or life partners there in this with the uh, turkeys here. But compared to a lot of male songbirds, who usually will stake out their own ter territory by themselves and will call to get the female's attention and have her decide if his territory is the best, these guys kind of compete against each other in a little bit of an interesting way. What'll happen is that a group of males will set up a lek, which is an area for males to engage in competitive displays and courtship rituals. So it's usually a pretty open area. Um, and little groups of males will perform their, or will set up their own leks to help attract the females. So. Males do move in small flocks. You do think you would have each male on their own like you would with like a lot of other songbirds we've talked about before, but actually it's more beneficial to move in small pairs and or in these small groups. And these groups are usually related. So this is actually a process um, or an option called kin selection where this flock is decided because they're related, they're gonna actually stick together with one dominant male and the other males will serve as wingmen. Uh, because again, for a lot of male birds, the main idea is to pass down their gene as much as possible. So even if those wingmen don't get to mate with a female, um, they've got somebody who will that will also pass down their genes. So they will actually work together just so that one of them at least gets, uh, gets dips. And that's basically a really interesting process. The wingman will actually just kind of help the dominant male look really good and also defend against any unrelated males that might come into that lek um, and try to attract the female's attention. Uh, so it's really definitely very interesting. Once a female is interested and she does call back to one of these male turkeys, uh, either one or more will start to congregate around her. That's when you'll start to see those fan tails, arched wings, they'll rattle their feathers a little bit and they're definitely gonna make a lot of those gobble calls. So, of course, at this point, that's also when the female decides, yeah, or nah, and <laughs> whether or not she's going to continue on. Uh, one thing I also did find interesting in this research is that the snood is one of the primary focus points for these females, as well as other males in sizing up another turkey. So, apparently, the longer a snood is, the more, uh, the stronger a male turkey is, and that's apparently a better genetic trait to have. Uh, so that is a big deal for them, which I found very interesting. So once the female has mated, which nesting period is going to be anywhere from March to May, it really does depend on the state and the type of weather that we're dealing with and where you're at. So that does vary. Um, but once they have um, mated, they're going to go off and do their own thing. Hens are going to find a very good nesting spot while the males are going to continue on the lek to continue to attract more females until nesting season is over. So the female was going to find a good spot with a lot of good uh, foliage coverage and she's going to just make a little shallow depression in the earth and she's going to basically um, lay her eggs either under brush piles or thick shrubs and then only use the plant material found at the site. She's not going to go build a nest like some of our other songbirds. Not that she is a songbird, but the songbirds that we talked about previously. So turkeys only have one brood. If their nest does fail early enough in the season, they might try again, but usually it's just going to be one, and for good reason. They can lay up to four to 17 eggs, depends on how they're doing, but they will lay one egg per 24 hours, sometimes 48, depending on how it's going, and only 
10 to 40% of these eggs survive. So she's going to have a lot more eggs to hope that her chances are better as to how many make it. Um, these eggs are a pale kind of tan or yellow color and they're evenly speckled. So there's no rings of any darker colors. You'll just see this um, speckling with brown or pink spots all the way throughout the shell. Uh, one other thing that I found is there are some cases of brood parasitism. So this is when one hen will go to another nest or another, another hen's nest, lay one of her eggs, and then keep on going. So she won't even be responsible for caring for the egg at all. So when um, scientists have actually taken DNA samples of these nests, they found that sometimes it's not even the same dad or mom. So it's an interesting case there as well, too. Uh, some people have, you probably have heard this more commonly done with brown-headed cowbirds, but other species do utilize this as well, sometimes with their very own, the very same species that they are. So once they've laid all their eggs, the incubation period is anywhere from 25 to 31 days, about a month. And then once these eggs finally hatch, the nesting period is only one day. So think about our bluebirds and our wrens and our chickadees and all that stuff. They take about two days to incubate and not two days, I'm so sorry, two weeks to incubate and then two weeks to nest. Turkeys are a little bit different. Their young are precocial, which means that when they hatch, they've got a lot of down and they're able to walk around and they're able to feed themselves. They will still be dependent on mom. It takes them one to two weeks before they can fly short distances and actually roost in trees, which is going to be where they are the safest. So that one to two week period is very stressful in regards to them staying safe and not being taken out by predators. But because they're mobile and able to walk around, it makes it much easier to care for them. Once they hit that two-week point where they can roost in trees and fly around, it's going to be much easier for mom to take them certain places as well and protect them from possible predators. So at that point, we have hit the end of their nesting season. They're starting to come into the winter season. So because there's no longer a concern for nesting or territory disputes, they're actually going to start flocking up. Um, when they flock up, they do have a hierarchy. The hens have a stable hierarchy with probably the most mature hen or the strongest hen taking the lead and the other ones following um, because you will sometimes have a situation where all these hens and all these poults meet up together and do their own thing, sometimes in groups of 200, sometimes smaller, but you never know with them. Um, meanwhile, toms will start grouping up and their hierarchy will constantly change because they are trying to one-up each other and see who is the best. Um, there are separate age groups of males, while the hens and the poults will all stay together. Regardless of age, the males are much more, again, territorial. So toms will stay together and jakes will stay together. You usually don't see them mingle around too much or not for long. So in the winter, uh, they will kind of continuously roam from place to place. The hens will go farther than the toms. They usually stay in their own area or like a much smaller area. But that's when they're going to focus on um, basically just foraging and um, keeping track that way. And they'll do their own thing until the next spring season. When spring comes back around, the hens start to... Um, move away from each other, find those nesting points because their nesting sites are sometimes very far away from where the tom strutting ground is or those leks are and other females. So they do a lot of traveling. Um, so they're going to establish those nesting territories. The toms are going to separate from each other. They know who's the biggest and baddest. They're basically going to find those strutting grounds again um, and maintain their own areas while the jakes, who are, again, much younger than the toms, are going to find their own territories because it's going to be hard to compete with some of those more mature males. So, obviously, uh, it's, they've got quite the interesting process there. And sometimes we do see turkeys in our area. Concord is a very interesting place, or wherever you're from, sometimes you've got a lot of um, suburban areas, and sometimes you've got a lot of wooded areas, so you never know when you're going to come across a turkey. But these guys do prefer a lot of mature forests with fruits and nuts. So if you want to provide something for your turkeys, or of course your other wildlife, uh, trees like oaks, hickory, dogwood, wild cherry, things that have food that will help them in the wintertime is also very important. 
Um, if you do happen to have turkeys that stop in your yard and you want to give them something while they're there, um, also sorry if you hear roofing noises, they're working on the roof. Um, sunflower or crack horn are a nice option to provide a little bit while they're there. They probably won't be staying in the area for long, so it'd just be like a little snack. Um, you can offer grit if you want. Um, dried eggshells are a great option for both turkeys and other birds to help continue digesting their food. Um, some natural ways to kind of help them out as well include reducing pesticides because they are going to be going for goodness they're going to be going for a lot of that insect uh, population in the spring for their young that is the same with a lot of other species of birds and also leaving the leaves if you've heard a lot about that already that's going to be what um, allows those insect populations to continue and for both their life cycle to complete in peace and also help a lot of our birds and other wildlife continue as well, too. So with that said, that's actually all I've got on the turkeys. Hopefully you guys found that interesting. Um, for those in the area, I will offer a coupon, a $5 off 25 coupon. Uh, the code is TURKEY. It's only available today, either for in-store or phone order as well. We are also having a second viewing of this presentation at 11 o'clock in-store. If, if you know anybody that's in the area that would like to check it out as well. Um, I hope you guys learned a lot. And uh, here's the resources that I used. I want to thank the Macaulay Library at Cornell Lab of Ornithology for a lot of the pictures. They've got really good credits as well, uh, really good photos and other things to check out for certain species, as well as great audio files on allaboutbirds.org too. Uh, so with that said, that's pretty much all I've got to say. I do want to say I hope you guys have a wonderful Thanksgiving. I hope everyone has a lot to be thankful for, or at least I'm very thankful for you guys even checking out these presentations. It's a lot of fun to educate or at least talk with you guys about uh, the fun birds that we have um, around us and in our area as well. So thank you all very much for joining me today. I hope you have a wonderful Thanksgiving, and I will see you guys next time. Bye!